Hey, thanks for tuning in. This is Christian Buckley. This is the post collab talk tweet jam. Uh, where today the the topic was, what was it? It was the takeaways from the Microsoft 365 virtual marathon. And we talked a bit about you know some of the takeaways. This month, of course, was also Microsoft Build, another minor event going on online. I don't know what the numbers were for Build. Uh, did you guys see those numbers published? I haven't seen anything. I heard it was high. It was in the hundreds of thousands yes, of exactly. participating, Good like 250,000 people or something crazy. Yeah. You guys were slightly under that. Just a little. <laughs> Just a little. Yeah, they've got a pretty good list, I think. They've got yeah, think a they few customers that Microsoft. That's right. Well, that's the secret. If you got to have that, that that secret to email spam, get the word out. You know? Yeah, well, they, I think it's something about if you have a billion people who use Windows or 75 million who use Teams, and uh, you're trying to say, hey, maybe some of our customers should come and talk about our products. <laughs> well, that's like a way and it's free. Then uh, it, it, that's something we should talk about. Then it says, it, well, they've got that many customers and yet only 250,000 showed up. <laughs> <laughs> right. What's going on? Yeah. Well, so, hey, you know, we, we yeah, go ahead. Christian, we only had 13,000 on our mailing list and we got 12,700 to join. I mean, that's a pretty good percentage. <laughs> that, that's, that's pretty decent, but we'll wait for the postmortem to get to find out uh, whether, you know, what, what that looks like. Uh, well, let's why don't we get started. So we got seven questions that we went through in the hour. I'd love to get your guys' thoughts on each of these uh, over the next 15, 20 minutes or so. So the first question we talked about, so what were the biggest announcements made during Build and the, mar the virtual marathon and why were they big? So what were the biggest announcements? You, you know what, let, let, me, let me just real quick first, only because I know it was a mistake. Now we, as MVPs, uh, we had seen a lot of the Project Cortex stuff, but they accidentally leaked, according to Chris hey, Portman. Don't even uh, talk like, about it. Don't even talk yeah. about. It. We don't. We don't want this. We don't want this video getting yanked. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Right, yeah. So there was. There was nothing about it. anything. I <laughs> think it was. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about, Jeff. <laughs> I was just going by what they talked about during the conference. Uh, yeah. Project Cortex. Uh, you know, they they say at the end of June, beginning of July, general. Um, yeah, that's that's what's been shared and talked about. I think the word I keep hearing now is uh, summer. <laughs> yeah. That's that's what I heard over and over again during the conference was summer. Which I think technically we are summer, so even now this is. So well, summer is technically Some, summer gives them a nice right, little uh, period ah, to talk off. about. Yeah. Well, I know that the uh, the other big news from a collaboration standpoint was, of course, the Microsoft Lists app. Yeah. Uh, and so we're going to see much more about that, I think, over the next couple months and into Ignite. I think it'll be I, the most exciting thing about preparing for Ignite. So we're seeing from this event, um, from Build and from the virtual uh, uh, marathon and other events that are coming up in the, the like next week, is it the Galactic Summit? Um, yeah. Yeah. Is we're going to start to see What's then that? scenarios. <laughs> We're going to start to see, but scenarios. We're going to as people get their hands on and start playing with this technology. We're waiting for it, but we're going to start to see specific scenarios, um, industry examples. And that's going to be really fascinating to take a look at with something as powerful as the uh, List app. Yeah, I, I think List is a good example of something where there was a lot of stuff that happened in the consumer world. Let's take some of that technology of what's happened in the consumer world and apply a lot of that what people are asking for like hey i'm able to do this thing in this consumer app i want to now have that for for the enterprise or i want to hook up my data in this way and i don't need all of the other stuff that a sharepoint site gives me i just want to focus on my data make it simple and easy to consume and absolutely extensible to the to the max yeah and Any christian other, you know what yeah. you hit on a great point uh you know, if it's available for consumers, you got to make it for business. I mean, you know, the team's engineers are no dummies, you know, coming up, not coming up with, but mimicking the Zoom look and feel um, for the most part. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, remember when Yammer first came out, everyone's like, yeah, it's like Facebook, except for business. Yeah. Uh, you know, because Facebook is really easy. I'm not going to say the new Facebook is easy. But like anything else, 
but you get used to it, it's easy. And just to let you know, here's beautiful Santa Monica. <laughs> Those trees could be anywhere, Jeff. Yeah. That, that, yeah, I think that's, that's, a, that's a background. It's kind of a blurry background. You've got a there. car that's next a, to a green screen. That green screen. I know. Screen, totally that, yeah, that, that beach, that's, uh, I mean, that could be the moon landing for all we know. It's all faked. That could be. That could be. It's my new background. <laughs> Yeah. Let, let me let me say as well, I do think that user voice drives what the product teams are working on more than anything these days. Yeah. Um, and absolutely, I think that the product teams are paying way, way more attention to user voice than them going heads down for three years, working on something and then surprising us. So I think as an example, that conversation we had on the Tweet Jam around, hey, this is actually... It's part of our new cadence. We're not going to be shocked as much as we would in the past because we're so plugged in. And I, I think whether you're an MVP or whether you're somebody who's tapped into what Microsoft is working on, fluid framework, um, project cortex, uh, lists, tasks, all these things that uh, you know we're, we're seeing, even the mixed reality SharePoint spaces stuff, we have been so prepared for when that stuff lands, that we may not be as surprised. Like I saw some really cool demos on Spaces from Mike Gennady and uh, I think some, some of the French MVPs who are working on some cool cool stuff. And you go and jump into and you're like, I didn't know Spaces could do that. But because we, we get shown the stuff way early, that by the time it lands and all of the goodness is built into it, it's now time for us to go and approach it in a new way. Yeah. Well, this, uh, that's a kind of a good segue into the second question, which was around the, the what are the, the primary themes this month with these two major events? You know, what, what are those, those themes that really kind of stood out? And, you know, and then the relevance to your business. I mean, it, it, we're talking a lot about the collaboration technologies. If you go and you look at the list of announcements made during Build, for example, and three fourths of that were Azure based, you know, yeah, so much yeah. of it. Of course, it's a dev centric, it's a de developers conference. Um, but so much was around Azure and AI as, yeah, as themes. Yeah. And I've said for a long time that some of the most exciting features that are coming out from an end user and information worker standpoint in the Microsoft 365 space are all these AI driven capabilities. It's really just lit up um, the Office Suite and Outlook and, and SharePoint Online and kind of all these different tools. Um, so it's not, again, like you said, it's not, it's not surprising that we're, we're seeing some of the announcement that we're seeing. It's just building on what we've been trickling, seeing over the last couple of years. So I was I was doing some analytics um, or reading up about some analytics around Project Cortex and AI and search, and it was talking about patents around AI and how in the last year, and this was a 2018, 2019 report, it was talking about Microsoft as the leading AI deep learning um, in terms of hundreds, just pumping out hundreds and across the whole group, thousands of patents around AI. The whole world is just so AI focused, but Microsoft has, has been focusing on how do we consumerize or how do we take those things and democratize them for the business? You know, all the, it's like, here's a stack of all the things we've done around speech technology. Here's all the stack of stuff we've done around voice and all the stuff around image recognition and text recognition and even summarization and vision and, and so on. Well, what, what Project Cortex is, it's basically wrapping around all of those AI technologies and giving us something that we can actually work with in the enterprise. And basically, take it's taking AI from being a science project, and maybe it's 100 science projects, but basically wrapping all those science projects into something that that is now into a web-based GUI that you can actually work with that changes the way we work in business. It's democratizing AI and making it ready, enterprise ready, enterprise ready cloud environment instead of a science project. And one thing is interesting preparing for this event as well is just some of that those AI features and how they've integrated into commonplace. Running the global conference, things like live translation during the conference into the different languages, plus the ability to communicate as we're collaborating in teams on this in, to run the conference. 
the ability in teams just natively say, okay, this text, we've got this message from our Japanese team. What does this say? I don't speak Japanese. Just to be able to say, hey, translate this message. <laughs> and so it makes it facilitate the, the collaboration, but the AI has just become a common, simple part of the tools that I think a lot of us lose track of the fact that all the AI and infrastructure thing that goes in to put that in place, it's just become commonplace now. So I think a lot of these AI investments Microsoft's making, they're going to keep enhancing and working on it to the point where the line between what we did before and the fa amount of artificial intelligence that's built into it just disappears and it just becomes part of our daily lives. Yeah. Well, the, so the third question we talked about, and maybe this is a good place to, to insert this is, you know, what sessions or topics do you think people need to pay part, particular attention to and, and why? So, I mean, you guys, I, I, you know, were, I know, behind, running the behind the scenes, running the event, and so you're focused on, but also watching snippets of a bunch of different things. Are, are there any specific topics that you think uh, uh, may have been, I don't know, underwatched, you know, should have, you, you, you hope more people go and, and take a look at the recordings of and follow up on. Uh, there actually was a list um, deep dive. You know, there actually was a session on lists that once this thing is done, I'm going to go, I want to go back and watch that. There were six sessions on Project Cortex where Naomi actually talks about what's next for Project Cortex. I definitely want to go back and watch that. She was speaking when I was. Yeah, <laughs> which really yeah. upsets me because I did I did two of the six yeah. sessions on Project Cortex <laughs> right. in the event. Um, did she trickle out information across the different sessions that she did? So you have to watch all of them. That would have been the smart do. marketing I move. Think you do. Right. I think but the other things like with collection of them. Yeah, yeah, Naomi had two of the Project Cortex sessions, but yeah, we even had some other different people from the community talking Spanish. about it as well. So we got the so, Microsoft uh, pitch, and we got the extra stuff too. Yeah. 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 Any other sessions, though, that uh, you think people need to go take a look at? I think there are a lot of cool ones on search, like even I think Bill's keynote on a lot of the cool stuff. They're integrating search and all that sort of stuff. Just seeing some of the numbers, I, I will have to kind of look and see actual attendance. But it's kind of one of those ones that's like there's a lot of cool stuff in here, but just how many people attended just because there's so much going on and we'll have to, just have to see what those numbers look like. Yeah, I did an interview with, with him a little while back for uh, Loop 365, which Noah Sparks and I do, uh, where we interviewed the product team. And and so he he gave kind of a walkthrough and and uh, and high level demo of that kind of stuff. So that's also something people go take a look at. But yes, it's, it's a, it was actually one of the productivity tips that I shared came from his, uh, from his demos of uh, going and building that custom list. It's, it's uh, it, it, what's cool is, you know, we, we've, of course, we've had uh, the ability to go in and create views into SharePoint lists, but this is much more in depth uh, and really cool that you could go in and have like, you know, ongoing queries, customize the result set that people get. It's dynamically updated as content is added, of course, to your, your, your listed libraries, but then you can also add that as a tab within a team and make that easily and have different views. Oh, it looks like we've lost <laughs> two, two guys here, but uh, it looks like Jules. Oh, he's there, Jules there he, is. he was switching. I know. There we go. Well, let's, um, so the fourth one, you, in, are you muted there, Joel too? Um, but the fourth question was, did you pay attention to partner and vendor activities or announcements? And if so, what caught your attention? So I, I do have something to tell you there. So we, virtual events, it, it takes some special attention to vendors. And I tried to come up with a couple of creative ideas, you know, and you take the physical vendor expo hall, and that's kind of how, how we work with vendors in the real world. We create this space for them, and you try and carve out time on the calendar to have people go visit them. The dynamics of a virtual event, it's much more challenging, I think, to do that. You know, sure, you can have a logo here or there, but how do you actually get vendors involved in the content consuming? How do you encourage your attendees to go visit the vendors? And how can you create an environment that's conducive for the vendors to be able to have engaging conversations? So we did a number of activities. One with our sponsors, we actually allowed them to contribute sessions. So we, we integrated them right into the event. Yeah. If you're sponsoring, we want you 
to get involved in our content. So because people can self-select. So right. from from that perspective, if you've got something to say, let's let's get you involved in in the in the environment in the conference. So there's and some there's cool things side. I can say about those those sponsor sessions as well. We actually had some really good content from the sponsors, not just a sales pitch, but a lot of real world stories and use cases. Okay, hey, here's how it happened. Like we had some of the some of the sponsors talking about, okay, here's how impact businesses are impacted by COVID and how they interacted with it. It's just so it's a lot of real world examples came out of it instead of like, okay, who here's our cool product. They're actually saying, okay, here's some things that we've experienced and we've seen that companies are working with and how they react and respond to those. Well, well you know, well, over the years, you even have companies or, or, or like the SharePoint Fest event was one that going back to, you know, uh, uh, 2011, 2012, the first one that I went and company I was working for, they bought a sponsorship, they got a session, I went and spoke in that paid sponsor session and we had a tremendous, uh, uh, you know, they, they knew that they were getting educational like information but that you know, half of it was going to be product pit pitch and yet it was still a full audience and when people know that it's hey it's a sponsor session i mean the sponsor still needs to to come up with some interesting content provide that value there um but then you also don't have to be shy about and hey here's how we solve this problem and answer questions on that. For people attending, it's a great opportunity to be very open, drop all of the uh, you know the charades about you know not saying anything about your your company. Uh, but you can then ask you know flat out questions about that. It's a great way to see that in an open environment. So that's one way I think is a, is a great way of of incorporating partners. Yeah, and let me let me tell you as well. Having having done some of those sessions, and even Perficient was one of the sponsors. We ended up having. With the two sessions that we got, we ended up doing uh, ask the expert panel type sessions. So, and that which was kind of a unique thing since we didn't really have panels in any of our other sessions. It gave us the opportunity to do a little bit of that trusted advisor come in, ask us anything. Let's have a discussion about the announcements. We actually ended up talking a lot about lists. We ended up talking about some of the quotes from Jeff Teeper from the keynote and had a lot of dialogue around project cortex project query or power query and uh, you know some of some of the other things that are just going on right now being able to just step back and say how are you guys dealing with with this it turns into more conversational instead of feeling like you're being talked to we actually went in to a meetings teams meeting and we're able to all go on video and basically chat with the attendees they didn't have to just put their their stuff into text, they could actually ask questions. We can have dialogue. So that was that was nice um, as well. And well, I did actually go to the expo hall. Um, expo hall, as in go to the sponsor page, every sponsor had a button next to their their logo where you can basically go join the sponsors, go go basically go visit with them. And each of them had, at least the ones I visited, they had kind of a rotating video and there were one or two people that were there to have dialogue and conversation with, ask them stuff. Um, in fact, I, I, very memorable, I went into the app point one and they had some of their COVID videos running and talking about things that they were actually doing with the crisis. And it was uh, qu quite relevant. Well, it's, it's, uh, I made the comment and I, I'm, I'm interested to see what uh, Microsoft does. I know they were waiting to really start promoting their Inspire conference in July, the partner conference, until um, Bill kind of closed out and they took the learnings from that event. But when you start to get to, in, in, especially Inspire, but Ignite to some degree, where I would argue it's less about the content and more about the interactions that you have at those physical events, like, how are they going to pull that off? And and I guess the point is, you know, that organizers need to be more thoughtful about the sponsors and providing value and how do you connect and get people to interact. I mean, it's, it, you know, it, so it's great that you guys came up with some solutions for the, the, the virtual marathon event. Um, it'll be interesting to see. That's why I think, you know, you guys do a write-up of what you experienced and what your learnings were and provide that feedback back to Microsoft because, you know, we're, we're not going to have a Microsoft event until, uh, you know, the, the next fiscal year after this one coming up. 
Um, yeah, the next in-person event. Yeah. yeah. So what are they going to do for the next? So let me let me tell you one events? one last thing that I think is important for people to kind of understand what we were trying to do there. We had a raffle for the Oculus Quest, which I think is one of the coolest items out right now in the in the tech geeky community. Um, so this idea of a raffle, how do you qualify for the raffle? Well, we want you to visit the the vendors, right? Well, how do we encourage you to go to the booth? Well, it's a scavenger hunt. So this scavenger hunt is you got to find the marathon related items that each of the different booths have or each of the vendor videos have to encourage people to watch the videos. Now, in an ideal world, we would work with each vendor as they're making their videos. Obviously, we're in a much more crunch time. This event came together a lot faster than that. So we basically hid, hid, didn't really hide. We stuck the marathon items on every video page. And then we, we played those videos at the beginning and the end of every keynote with the intention that attendees will at least watch it rotate once through so they can then go and fill out their raffle so that they can join the the, the chance to win to, to, to win the Oculus Quest. Yeah. And I think that that was noble, bold, scratch the itch for the sponsors to make sure that uh, they're watching those, plus also encouraging people to go visit the booths and yep. another way of kind of involving the scavenger hunt of going and visiting visiting the sponsors where you know you can't physically stamp or a punch card or whatever but that that kind of idea go and visit the sponsors go spend some time with them but uh, hopefully there's some some semblance of interaction with the sponsors as well yeah and, and to that effect uh, you know having the sponsors choose uh, different sessions to sponsor I thought that was good as well um, I had uh, two of my sessions, well, two, it ended up being three uh, uh, sponsors or sessions sponsored. And basically it was no more than um, uh, Lyman putting the sponsor logo on it and me talking about them for a minute. And then I visited them. I visited CoreView. I visited, uh, actually, I visited everyone but uh, Avpoint for whatever reason, just to check it out just see what the experience was. Uh, again, to me, it's only going to get better, right? Uh, Freeman uh, companies, the big exhibit place, they're, put it, they're still plugging along. They're doing virtual conferences themselves, of course, charging a boat ton of money. But, uh, you know, theirs is going to be much more interactive, Joel, you know, sort of like uh, your sure. 3D reality stuff, except for a 2D kind of guy like me. It's a really neat experience. So I think that it's only going to get better. And trust me, those Microsoft uh, Teams en engineers are plugging away at coming up with a great solution for uh, that virtual trade show. Because we need that. We need that. I, I think that what we did, call it what it is. I'm calling it cutting edge, bleeding edge, because no one else has done it really, or we haven't seen it. So I think that what we did with our resources is off the hook. And yes, there were bugs. Yes, there were hiccups. Yes, there were there was some downtime. But overall, I mean, look, you know, there, there are going to be people that complain about no matter what the best pizza in the world. They'll be like, ah, oh, it was just a little bit too much sauce. Ah, uh, you know, the cheese is just a little bit too cheesy. Not like it could ever be too cheesy. But, you know, people are always going to find things to pick at. I get it. But you know, obviously, you know, living this thing for the past two and a half months, I think it was as good as, uh, you know, for, for four volunteers that have full, four full-time jobs, Joel, Ryan, and Galen and myself, uh, you know, and I had just hired a new guy on my team that I was training him last week as, or this, this week as well. I think, you know, we kicked ass, especially, uh, uh, Ryan, Joel, and Galen. Yes. What's on that, Jeff? I would never call you two dimensional. You're at least two and a half. Hey, hey so uh, so next question, number five. So this is kind of getting back to the product related, but I'd love to hear your thoughts though. So what three features available now or announced? So obviously, hashtag no leaks. We're not talking about anything that we shouldn't be talking about, Jeff, with Cortex. <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, what three features are having or will have the biggest impact for 2020 and why? 
Oh, let, let me, let me, I'll, I'll, I'll go since I haven't heard anybody else jumping at this. I do think that Project Cortex slash spaces. So basically, we're talking about the new SharePoint set of things, even though we're not calling them SharePoint enhancements. Project Cortex's knowledge center lives in SharePoint. And I think that what's interesting about that is you could say, I've, I've heard this kind of exhausted asper, uh, exhausted asper, sorry. People That's being exhausted word. about what's happening in the SharePoint space, <laughs> where it's like, hey, we moved all our data to SharePoint, now what? Yeah, I think you probably heard that before. Now, the now what part of it is, hey, check it out. We can analyze your data and extrapolate these topics and have this really cool knowledge center where it integrates with the tools you use every day. I think that's going to have the most impact to the enterprise, especially those who take advantage of it. But this idea of AI reasoning over your data, I think there's going to be this revolution of taxonomy, this revolution around the managed metadata uh, in, in terms of how can we get AI to work for us? How can we actually welcome the AI into the enterprise? You know, in the consumer world, I feel like AI has been kind of brought into it. We don't even know what it's doing at Facebook and Google and so on. AI is doing so much work at these consumer spaces, and we're not even opting into it. Here in the enterprise, you're going to have executives who are going to bring in these AI-based solutions, working on our data, providing solutions. And I kind of see this entrance of AI into the enterprise as going to be a major theme. Like this is the beginning of a wave of what can AI do for the enterprise? And that's the one I think I'm most jazzed about. It's going to touch Word. It's going to touch SharePoint and Teams. It's going to be across all the productivity tools and just start to change. Like when our kids are now doing what we're doing, this welcoming AI to do automation and work, all this power platform integration with all these tools and so on, the, the AI getting involved in the in in all this data is absolutely going to be something that we're we're going to look back on this day and say remember when ai joined the enterprise and we started having robots work for us you know these are robots you can't look at but basically the the job open just happened right there's a there's a line of robots that are now going to go start entering the workforce that just happened you know well joel AI guess is what big. joel guess what uh, what we haven't really talked about yet is Microsoft's acquisition of what I call a low, sort of a low code robotic process automation, right? They bought uh, Soft Omotive, I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, mm -hmm. That's going to expand the Power Automate uh, um, uh, stack big time, right? Um, yeah. 9,000 global yeah. customers, that's great. They didn't buy it for the customers, right? They bought it for, you know, that comprehensive low-code desktop automation, right? Um, that's That sort of went under the radar. Christian, I, I don't know if you've, I'm sure you saw it, but yeah. guess what? Uh, if I'm automation anywhere, UI path, Blue Prism, uh, Kofax, you know, my yeah. friends in Intex, I'm a little bit nervous, right? You know, look, we all thought that Nintex might be out of business. We all thought that Avpoint might be, you know, based upon, uh, you know, Microsoft's acquisitions and enhancing their capabilities. My friends over at BA Insight, when uh, when Microsoft really went all in on search, were like, oh boy, those search companies, they're in trouble. But you know what? They're embracing it. So the fact that Microsoft is really investing heavily in RPA, to Joel's point, you know, AI, which is obviously part of it, the machine learning. And again, Joel put it very well. You know, guess what? All these robots are entering the workforce. Now. Absolutely. Very well put, Joel. And, uh, you know, all it's going to do is help guys like me, especially in my new role, because guess what? My new role at Fujitsu is spreading the word about how scanners are the on-ramp to this, you know, digital transformation. It's the on-ramp to RPA. It's the on-ramp to flow automate. Because guess what? 
that's, you know, you enter the paper and then boom, there it goes. It goes out into the cloud and then it gets dispersed to where it's supposed to go. Yeah. So, you know, uh, unless uh, Microsoft gets uh, gets back into the hardware business, of course, they're selling surfaces. But unless they get into the scanner world, I, I pretty much have a job for a while. <laughs> well, maybe that's a, that's a good segue. Question six, we said, if you could give one piece of advice to Microsoft leadership, what would it be? So based on what you've seen this this month through these events, what would what feedback would you give to Microsoft leadership? Let's let Ryan go first. Yeah, I was I'm thinking the same thing. As, 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 far oh, as, sure the, were, sure tactical side, as far as like the technical side, like putting this conference on, some of the big things that I think are a must if for anybody that's gonna be trying to do this on a regular basis or even just trying to do, accomplish anything close to what we did is there needs to be a lot more automation possible. Because right now to configure and set up all of the, to get this event running, it's a very manual process. Yeah. So if you want to say, hey, I need to create a live event, somebody has to go in through the Teams UI and click all the options. So we had, if we had one of our rooms went down, like when we had the Teams outage, somebody had, or somebody accidentally hit end on the live event too soon, we had to go through and spin up a whole new one, change out all the links and all that stuff, Whereas if we would have had like an API to be able to create those, we could say, okay, run this script, reset up this room, update all the URLs, we're done. It just it was in order to do this efficiently. If this is what Microsoft wants people to do on Teams, they need that option because otherwise, trying to tell people, okay, you have all these sessions you're going to be doing. Oh yeah, by the way, every last one of them has to be created by hand. Yeah, it's it's just not feasible. It's not going to be. We opted to go with longer room based instead of session based events just for that reason because trying to manually create 411 live events who's got time for that right so we we opted to go shorter and just kind of make it a little easier okay we'll go with larger blocks and that saved us time but then also created its own set of there's a bunch of post production that needs to be done right to well, there's that yeah, we're going to be busy with the uh, 320 plus hours of content that got generated now well, this, this is one of the discussions that we've been having for weeks. Like we're running the uh, every Monday the office hours, uh, and we're live streaming. And you know, and, and Teams doesn't do the live streaming over the social network, so you have to use third party solutions like yeah. OBS and Restream yep. with the virtual cam and do all this, all of this stuff, which with, with which you can like with using Zoom, which we did and got criticized for using Zoom. Microsoft people, what are you doing using Zoom? Well, because it was designed for that single purpose to go and do that and has the live streaming capability. So so my my feedback is just like, it, you know, given the rise in online events and doing broader multi, you know, global events and are making, even if they're smaller in scale, like a SharePoint Saturday, yeah, um, yeah. That, which you can then manage, I think, you know, 20 or 30 sessions, you can manage having as standalone recordings versus doing the blocks. It's still a lot to go and manage there. Microsoft needs to make a decision. They're an enterprise collaboration. Teams is enterprise collaboration technology. It's not been the use case. It's not been designed to go and do things like this. But people would embrace if Microsoft could support these scenarios and add the features and capabilities into automate, as you said, Ryan, a lot more of this. Microsoft should decide that, you know, we can be for the enterprise and we can. Yeah, so well, like, I'm just going to piggyback on what Christian's saying there. Uh, I've, I've been delivering webinars on Teams and then it's on GoToMeeting or it's on Zoom or whatever, and somebody will complain in a huge way, you know, the ready talk or whatever. We, we delivered this and our speakers were saying, how many people came? Oh, I yeah, absolutely need to be able to have analytics. I need to be able to understand attention. I need to be able to be able to really understand, this is how many people came to your session. Here's a list of those people who actually came to your session. I can't do a webinar and not know how many people showed up. That's not right. an option. Like whether it's my own company or even doing it for a vendor, the the who came, we need really, really good analytics. Like that's a key thing to be able to run it as a platform. 
uh, as a webinar. So when people say, hey, why didn't you use Teams? You know what, I could actually give you the list, but yeah. uh, you don't want that list. I want that list to go to Microsoft and I want them to address those features. Uh, and let me let me take one other thing. There's uh, our feedback for for Microsoft. This these days and age this day and age with COVID and this this real serious not push to work from home, but you are working from home. That changes the nature of things like SharePoint Saturday. It also changes the nature of things like we've been getting into hackathons. We've been getting into the Power Apps in a day the app in a day how do we take those things and make those virtual i and think that's that my say, point i think it's it is everybody talk all the talk about the new normal like right it's all those how do things. we do it's workshops like, right. how do we make something that is engaging we need our tools our web tools to be something where you can say help me help me do a workshop help me work on my app that i'm working on we need to take this video chat thing to another level Joel, it's not just say share my desktop. It's the let's actually work together. I I want to reach through the screen, not just one one on one, but five on one, so everybody's watching what's happening. We're interacting. We're actually building an app through the the web inter through the, the through the the video interface. Joel, I think that those what? experiences of how to take it so it's not so flat. Yeah. yeah, but th think about universities, think about uh, elementary, high schools. That's what teachers are struggling with. And yeah. trust me, they're not using Teams. You know, they're using Zoom so they can really see, you know, exactly to your point. So trust me, the Teams engineers are working 24-7, all those hundreds of people in Redmond all, all over where they're, wherever they're developing this stuff because it's got to be like school. You know, when it's like that, you know, Christian, I was watching Collab Talk. I was super busy this morning, but uh, I think one of the questions came up. Hey, you know, we don't want this virtual conference thing to be reality in the future, right? I know conference organizers don't want it because nothing beats face to face. And although this is great to see you guys, Joel and Ryan and you too, Christian, you know, I like hugging people and bumping, whatever the heck it is. Uh, you know, this is great and we could, you know, do our virtual fist bumps and all, but you know, what, what are we going to send out swag? We're still waiting for our MVP swag. Uh, you know, uh, I was watching you know, this video, by the way, I think we have a zoom, uh, <laughs> advocate over here. No, I, I do think that teams, the, the teams in education is a huge, huge thing. I loved the Australia scenarios and examples of how they were using Power Platform and Teams. And I'm not just trying to evangelize all that jazz, but absolutely, I think the innovation that's happening, it's gonna be going through user voice where basically teachers and how they're using the technology and what they need. Like a great example, imagine, I was on one of the, one of the calls where we had to move a live event to a meeting. There was 200 people on. And the person who was running that one was going crazy because there's one, somebody's got a dog barking, somebody else has got um, somebody talking to the person, and there is no one click mute everybody. There's no way to, even if I'm running a room of 10 and somebody has a conversation with somebody, I need to be able to reach out and Mute all. At least say mute your 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 microphone. Like give me the ability to even suggest it. Like, hey Joel, we can hear you. You know how many times I've actually heard that? It's an it's annoying. <laughs> they shouldn't have to say, hey Joel, mute your microphone. They should be able to push a button. Or I could even opt in. I will opt in. I would love to opt in and say mute me when I'm talking to somebody else because I it's hard for me to know whether I'm muted or not. It's not absolutely Ooh. It's, it's black and white. Talk about accessibility here. Let's make sure that it's easy to know whether you're muted or not. And it, it disappears. We just line. muted you so we can't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, we had our first minutes of our first 15 minutes of our finish line. We were talking to ourselves on mute because we didn't realize like, oh, yeah, we got, the, we got the live stream started. But, oh, oops, we forgot to unmute. Uh, yeah, that, that's quality video every time. <laughs> Especially well, hey, guys, lip reader. So, yeah, the, so the last question would we'll just is watch what you're miming. Yes. 
Uh, so as, as Microsoft 365 continues to grow and expand, what can Microsoft and your local user group leaders do to support and improve the community? I always like to end, you know, like to, to think, okay, we've had this experience. You guys just put on this event. How do we now, you know, take the kind of the the the, the key learnings from this and share that back with at the the local user group level? We're all involved in our local user groups as well as doing these l other larger events. Um, so what what would your thoughts be around you know, what can be taken back and guidance given to uh, user groups? One thing I think is kind of interesting is with this conference, it kind of forced a lot of people that are doing presentations that are used to doing physical presentations. They've now experienced doing a presentation virtually. They've experienced doing things in live events. So now we have as part of the conference, we've now trained a bunch of people that they now can take that information about how do we run these events? How do, what is it like to participate in one of these? So they can actually start spinning it up because they're, they're, the fact of the matter is there's as much as we want to get the world back to normal, it's going to be a while before we get to actually back to physical events for most of the world. So the ability to be able to, for people to have the information they need to say, hey, let's just go do a community event. We don't have to be actually in person. We can just do a, a virtual event, have our still have a user group meeting, still have some sort of connection with people without having to actually be there. Now people are starting to realize, hey, this is actually a possibility. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would add on to that. I think that um, user groups don't let them die. I've seen so many user groups where it's like, oh, well, this is going on. We'll wait until it's over to meet again. No. No, I think that these communities absolutely need to take advantage of whatever cadence you had before, it needs to continue. And if you think it's too hard, it's because you haven't tried running it on a meeting or a live event. The, what we just did, we did for the world. <laughs> you know, we basically took what we were gonna do in a SharePoint Saturday. We figured, hey, if we're gonna do it for one group or you know, for, 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 for a couple hundred people, we, we can do it for three, 13,000, why not? Um, so we, we, we proved you can do it <laughs> and you can. Now take, take what you learned being a producer or take what you learned, just take the technology we're working with everybody and see if you can actually make it work. Start small with meetings, do a, do a trial run with live events. I know it's a little bit hard, but do, do a tech check. We did four tech checks or something like that. Plus we did producer training. You could train your entire user group on how to do live events. All it takes is somebody going heads down. It's not hard to, to learn. And then you do it with guests. Everything we did, we did through guests. There was actually on. only five real accounts in that tenant, if you can believe it. Right. It's 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 pretty wild. Um, but yeah, user things. groups. The community I was gonna say, Joel. absolutely is essential. Keep it going. Keep the energy up. Keep the passion up. And uh, yeah, stay alive. Yeah. So one of those organizations, if you're one of those groups that said, hey, this is just hard. The beauty of everything being virtual now is it's there are a lot of groups that are doing virtual meetings. So if you want to partner up with another another city, say, hey, what, let's so we don't have to try and come up with the same content, having all these meetings here, we'll do a We'll do the cop topic one month. You have another city do the topic another month. But that way, you're kind of sharing the load a little bit, which makes things a little easier in this virtual world. Well, the other side of this, too, is that it's great. Like, uh, it seems like uh, Jim Wilcox, another MVP, uh, with the uh, New Hampshire uh, user group. And I've actually physically presented twice to that user group back in when I was traveling to Boston a lot and drove up and did that user group. And it's great to know these people in the physical realm as well as the, the virtual. Um, but they've just been doing um, just uh, every at least once or twice a week, just kind of time where people are on and they're just talking about whatever and and so somebody just will share like hey I, this is what i'm going through and hey this is what i'm experiencing at work or has anybody seen this announcement and they'll talk about that thing and it's just so people just kind of dial in maybe stay for 15 minutes maybe for an hour and a half uh and they're participating and even making that kind of thing uh, a reality and the fact that i was i saw they promoted publicly out through social channels like through Facebook, like, hey, we're doing this. If anybody's interested in dropping in, I'm like, 
hey, I know a couple of those folks. I'm just going to drop in. It was fantastic. Yeah. That's yeah. Great. And so there is a great way for you to go and see some of these activities. And like we publish all of our user group stuff through Meetup. And I'd say more than half of the people that participate in the webinars that we do for Utah are not based in Utah, not based in the United States. Uh, people dial in from all over and they're welcome. And so it's yeah. it's great to have that interaction. To that point, uh, we're, we're thinking about doing, you know, a smaller scale. And Christian, that is a, a great idea. Uh, I'm a big coffee talk guy. I mean, Joel is usually sleeping at seven, eight o'clock in the morning, but you know, for Ryan and I and Gail, and and then we'll get Eric Overfield involved. I'm running LA now. So between the three groups doing a coffee talk every other week, you know, maybe Wednesdays, eight to nine. Why uh, why is the Utah user group not invited to that stuff? Come on. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Make it just, just add add some hot chocolate and uh add Utah. Yeah, and we'll we'll get the virtual Riverside folks too, Ryan. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Well, hey, gentlemen, I know it's been uh, we've gone a bit longer than I had promised here, but really <laughs> appreciate the input on this. I mean, there's look, I think anybody that participates on that panel from the for these tweet jams, you know, you could go through and probably have just as long of a conversation and get rich insights out of it. So I really appreciate you guys. Uh, certainly, all of you guys have have participated in tweet jams over the years. I mean, Collab Talk, we're in our ninth year of doing wow. these events. Yeah. I know. It's just crazy. Uh, and so really appreciate your time today. And congrats again on, uh, I know as you're still kind of going through, and you guys have your laundry list of things, of the, things that went wrong. Don't dwell too much on that. Learn <laughs> from those things. But, you know, huge success. Congrats to all of you guys for that tremendous uh and share the numbers share the high level stats publish that stuff yeah, out yeah yeah you know, so i love the transparency no. i'm happy to share any stat that anybody wants to know yeah seriously. Uh, share the blog want people people to, yeah it's the good bad and ugly we want we want people to to know what we did what went well what didn't go well and uh learn from our mistakes i want somebody to challenge us actually <laughs> try and try and take us on Addison, Addison. I need you guys to send you guys all some of these um, stickers. <laughs> yeah, we got one of those. Yeah, That's so I, I, need to, I need to send those out to all of you. But uh, hey, really you know, appreciate it. Yeah. Hey, Christian, real quick, before we go, uh, Ryan, I know a lot of people have been asking when are all the videos or any videos. Yes. Of, yeah, yeah, when are those going to be available? What are you guys waiting for? Uh, we're waiting to – have time to go through 320 hours of content. So that's going to take some uh, processing time. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you guys seem like you got a regular night's sleep. You should have been on this. <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> yeah, post-production. Love it. All yep. right, guys. Hey, thanks. Joel, Jeff, Ryan, we'll talk to you soon. All right. See you. Appreciate it. Bye, everybody. Bye.